Well, I want to um, I want to do something different with the offering tonight, and um, I want to encourage you that um, uh, I hope you believe that you are sowing into good soil tonight. Wichlo jylle saai op goeie grond vanaf. Nou, voor ek een vers lees, ek het gevra om een videoclip vir jylle te wees, en ook jylle somme bykie lis te maak vir wat woensdag, donderdag en vrijdag aan gaan gebeur, ok? So I just want to show you some of the work that we've been doing just before lockdown, and uh, then, then I'll talk to you after the video. So if you have the video clip ready, guys. Release the fullness of your spirit. Hi to all our partners and friends around the world. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. It's been an exceptional year again. Um, God has been doing great things in our ministry. We have seen so many wonderful miracles, salvations and healings. And uh, if it was not for your partnership, we wouldn't be able to do what we are doing. So from the bottom of our heart, Shemaine and I and the HMI team, we want to say thank you for your wonderful support. Thank you for your love. And most of all, thank you for your praise. Um, if it wasn't for your praise, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing today. Uh, we have put together a short little video just to show you of the work that we have done and um, the work that we are going to continue to do. The invitations are flooding in from across the world. So many people are asking us to go around to all these different countries, countries that are not able to pay us, uh, countries that are not able to um, put us up in hotels and all stuff like that. But that's besides the point. We want to go out and we want to do a great work for Jesus. We want to fulfill the Great Commission and see the thousands and thousands of people giving their hearts to Jesus. So with your faithful support and your continued pr uh, prayer, we will be able to do this work that we are doing. So again from HMI, thank you so very much and I pray that you'll enjoy this video. Somebody give that praise. Oh. We want 
lovely tree that they put up here and all the papers that are hanging here are testimonies of the last revival that we had when we were here. Testimonies of healings and salvation and miracles that God had done. And I think this is just a great idea to remind people uh, of what God can do and what He is still going to do. Hey everybody, we greet you here from Indonesia. Uh, we're preparing for a great outreach tonight. Uh, uh, it's like a semi-open air meeting. Believe in God for big miracles, signs and wonders. Amen. So we are trusting God. Last time it rained so much here yeah. that uh, we couldn't actually even preach. So tonight we are believing God to do something great so that many people can come to know Him and that there will be many uh, healings as well taking place. And I'm trusting God for the most of all salvations. Amen. Bless you. Everybody, we're here in Jakarta. We're uh, standing 26 stories high on the building. Uh, we're just about to enter into church and have a great meeting, uh, trusting God for many souls and for healings and, and uh, miracles to take place. We greet you here from South Africa, Lichtenberg. Uh, we are having an open air meeting here in a soccer stadium uh, amongst the rural area, the black people, the colored people, white people, uh, all, all people coming together. 
and uh, we are seeing hundreds of people getting saved. We are seeing people being healed and delivered. It's just a powerful time, and I want to say thank you to all our partners. Thank you to everybody who keeps sowing into our ministry. We love you, and we ask you just to continue to pray for us. God bless you. Halleluja. Come on, we see no item om terug te gaan, stadion toe. Come on, we're gonna, hey, I'm believing for double what we had there. Who agrees with me? Come on, somebody. Oh, you look like nie baie opgewonde nie. We're gonna see 2,000 people get saved in Jesus' name. Come on, by faith, 2,000 people to give their hearts to the Lord in Jesus' name. So I just want to say thank you for all of you guys who've been sowing and helping us and, and thank you to Pastor for arranging, um, you know, for us to be able to go and minister and uh, bring the word there. The Bible says this, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. In uh, the third book of John, 3 John chapter 1 verse 5, listen to how nicely the New Living Translation puts this. He says, dear friend. You are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that they can be they so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. Isn't that beautiful? So when you're sowing into the ministry, you are partnering up with us. Hello, Afrikaans, jylle word vernote saam met ons. You are becoming partners. So every time you, you put money in the offering basket and you give, that money for me represents a new soul that's going to be born into the kingdom of God. Amen. Who would agree with me that souls will be coming in in the thousands, the hundreds of thousands in the name of Jesus. We are standing over 870,000 decisions for Jesus uh, in the time that I've been ministering. And just last week, somebody came and prophesied over me and said, the time that it took for you to reach your first million, the Lord says you will receive the second million in half the time. I said, I take that. Come on, who will agree with me for two million people to get saved within our ministry? And so every time 
uh, we go out, you are enabling us to go out and to preach the gospel. Indonesia, when we go there, you know, you don't get, we don't get big offerings. We don't get anything that's uh, significant to pay our hotels or our airfare. We don't get that. But what we do get is to see how God heals and saves the people. Amen. That one, that one video clip where we were under um, like that semi-open air thing and that guy in the, in the chair. Do you remember the guy who was uh, paralyzed due to the stroke? Well, you'll, you believe it or not, they carried him in. None of these people walk into the services. They are carried from the cars into the service. And uh, this man, that particular man was a Muslim and he was the chief of the village. He was the mayor, not just the chief, he was the mayor of that big village that we were in. And the Lord, he didn't understand any English that I was preaching. Obviously, we had an interpreter, but he had no idea of the God that we serve. And when I got in then, we began to preach the gospel and I began to lay hands. As you witnessed, the Lord healed that village leader, the mayor, and he turned from being a Muslim to becoming a Christian. Come on, isn't that some? That is so powerful. So, so powerful. And obviously because of that, you can imagine how the heavens just opened up and uh, the, the glory of the Lord. We just had phenomenal meetings in all of these areas. There in the Philippines, you know, again, we had record attendance. The Lord baptized over a thousand people in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Isn't that something wonderful? Come on, be Rocky Blaney. Come on, this God is such a good God. And obviously before lockdown, we were on our way to fly to Tonga. And God opened up another island. We have been blessed by God by going into the islands, you know, and going into the Asian countries. And so I'm believing now that after this, uh, this lockdown that all the countries are going to open up and that we will be able to go back to Tonga or go into Tonga for the first time and preach the gospel to that nation there. Amen. Who agrees with me? Fiji and Tonga and uh, Thailand and the Philippines and, and we have... Uh, uh, um, Indonesia and we have uh, all these different countries that are asking us all the time please come please come please come and I know that God is not finished with us that we have still many 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 more souls to win for the kingdom of God in Jesus name amen, amen. including South Africa amen. amen I love our country and our country is in desperate need of revival who would agree with me? Desperate need of a revival. And before I forget, I just want to say tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll be preaching again on, uh, on the internet, on Facebook. If you have not liked our Facebook page, please like our Facebook page. Just type in Dion Hockey and follow the religious organization. You'll see the emblem, the HMI emblem. And uh, like our page, follow us tomorrow morning. I'll, this morning was so interesting what Pastor read tonight. But this morning I was talking about shining your light for Jesus. And I was quoting the exact same scriptures pastor that you were quoting so um you know we are to shine our light but tomorrow morning i'll be teaching on how to run the race we are called to run the race for jesus who can say amen and so let's see how far i get and then wednesday morning with pastor's permission um we as a, as a, as our ministry we pray every wednesday morning from eight o'clock until nine o'clock tomorrow morning also eight until nine but on wednesday eight o'clock until nine o'clock and i and i just thought it would be a great idea that uh, we open up the church and you can come and pray with us on Wednesday morning from 8 until 9. But we will be sitting here on the platform, Stephen and I, and we will do our what we do. You know, we'll do our, um, our live broadcast. But then you can sit in with us in the live broadcast uh, if you'd like to and then pray with us. Listen. We have to pray Wednesday morning. If anybody's, uh, uh, Stephen and I, we, we stay up to date with the news. We are always listening to what's happening because we need to pray for the current circumstances that we find ourselves in. Whether it's overseas, we pray for the world, but we also pray for this country. And I don't know if anybody's read this or know about this, but Wednesday they are planning a total shutdown of South Africa. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be um, uh, marches everywhere around the world. Uh, 
uh, around the whole country. And so we need to desperately pray against this and pray that there will be no violence, no destruction, and no deaths in Jesus' name. Come on, who thinks that's very important? So if you love this country, you want to intercede for this country, come and join us on Wednesday morning. We'll open it up, and uh, we're going to ask you to come and, uh, and sit in with us and agree with us in prayer. Is that okay? Wie dan kan sal kom kom woensdag ochend? Vat jou lunch vroeger. Take your lunch one hour earlier and then come and spend it. Wouldn't that be great to spend that time with the Lord in prayer? Amen, as we pray, if you can. But God bless you. Thank you. So that, the, the offering that you're giving tonight is going purely towards the ministry. Again, it's a ministry, Healing Ministries International. The offerings that we get goes into the ministry. Shemaine and I earn a salary. Stephen and Bianca earn a salary. We don't take the money and put it in our pockets. Are you, are you understanding that? And so when you help us, we are wanting to fly to America right now. Um, Eddie, Eddie who plays the guitar, he just brought me a beautiful prophetic word. He says, I dreamt about you last night. I said, really, Eddie, what did you dream? He says, I dreamt you were standing on the platform uh, in the church and you were talking about offerings and you were sharing a testimony. He listened to that. I didn't say it. Eddie said it. He says, you were sharing a testimony how you received a helicopter. <laughs> Come on, I take that in Jesus' name. Yeah. Why not? We gaan saam met my stem for a helicopter in the name of Jesus. Oh, I can net see who see the rocket of you. You're jealous because I'm a helicopter to get in your name. But strangely enough, the other day, Shemaine and I were driving in Pretoria, in Centurion. There's a big factory that builds helicopters and sells helicopters. And I'm not lying to you. I drove past there, stretched my hand out, and I said, Lord, I just thank you for our helicopter. Because we travel around so much. We fly so, so far. And the Lord, I'm just thanking you for my helicopter. And so the Lord heard that, and he's, he's, he saw that in a dream, and I take that prophecy in Jesus' name. Amen. As jy nie kry nie, is omdat jy nie vra nie. Ek vra. Amen. Well, take your offering out that you would like to sow tonight into the ministry. I'll give you offer on the Bianca is standing in the back there. And uh, if you want to swipe a card, you don't have cash with you, but you brought your credit card or your debit card, then please, you are very welcome to go to Bianca and she will help you um, uh, to, to uh, swipe the card. There also, we have a, a snap scan and zapper. Um, which you can also use over there with, uh, with that part. So um, are you ready to give tonight? Are you ready to give tonight? Otherwise, I'll just wait a little bit longer. Jylle glo, jylle saai op goeie grond. Vat jou biermans hand, let's take our neighbor's hands, let's lay hands on this offering. If you're going to give with your credit card, lay hands on your credit card. And Father, we just pray this, mo uh, this evening that everybody who is going to give tonight, again, Lord, I pray that they will give according to the scripture. And the scripture says, let us not give grudgingly or under compulsion, but Lord, you said you love a cheerful giver. And I'm asking you, Lord, that people who trust in the ministry and they believe the work that we are doing is a good work, that, Father, when they give, they will give cheerfully. And, God, my prayer again tonight is that you will bless each and every one a hundredfold return in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen if you agree? Lord, I'm asking for a hundredfold return. We rebuke. I rebuke the spirit of poverty. Somebody say amen. We break the curse of poverty. We bind the spirit of stinginess. We come against the spirit of fear and doubt and unbelief. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon this seed. It is seed that we are sowing, Father, so that all of us will be mightily blessed in Jesus' name. And if you agree with me, say amen. While they're still busy on that side with the offering, I just want to remind you, if you are going to go to Blader, uh, Bladerville, remember it's going to be outside in the open air, so it's going to be chilly. So please dress warmly.
take um, take some gloves with you and a little hoodie and you know a, a blanket or whatever but just make sure that you are um, protected against the cold is that okay and then we want to ask you to please I'm asking you don't stay away but we need your support and the reason I'm asking this is we need prayers to sit in the audience and to pray while I'm preaching to believe God that with there will be signs wonders and miracles healings to take place amen the services start at 6 30 so uh, in Blader at the soccer stadium. So when you go there in Bladerville at the soccer stadium, 6.30, we're going to start. And uh, we'll, we'll try and finish by, I don't want to make any promises, but by about 9 o'clock, I'll try to finish and not keep it too long unless there's 10,000 people that come. Come on, why not? That's 50 days and means in the door. God can give us more than 10,000 people. Amen. Who agrees with us? And that, uh, and and listen, I'm believing. Pastor told me there's a whole group of churches that'll be working with, and it's just going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. It's getting out of our comfort zone, and doing something great for God. So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm looking forward to seeing you there on Wednesday night. Come on, tell your neighbor, I'm looking forward to seeing you there on Wednesday night. Some of you say, well, I'm too scared to go there. Then you don't believe in Jesus, the blood of Jesus, or the angels of Jesus. Hello. Can I say that again? If you're too afraid to come to Bladerville, then why, why are you afraid? Because the God is with us. His angels are around us. The blood of Jesus is over us. Can I get an amen? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. The Lord will protect us in the mighty name of Jesus. Well, thanks for all the positive amens that I'm getting. Come on, I want you to, where did she disappear to now? Bianca, they, let's stand to our feet and let's give Bianca a very big welcome as she comes to share her testimony with us tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah, come on, bless the gift that the Lord has sent us in Jesus' name. Hmm. Amen. Wait, don't sit yet, don't sit, don't sit. Okay, now give God a bigger hand, amen? <laughs> amen. Thank you, everybody. You may be seated. <laughs> Good evening. Like you heard, my name is Bianca Hockey, married to Pastor Stephen. I'm Pastor Dion and Charmaine's daughter in grace, not in law. <laughs> amen. <laughs> um, so, goeienaand, dames en heren. That is my Afrikaans for the night, amen. <laughs> so now that I've gotten through my Afrikaans, <laughs> let me start with my testimony. So tonight, I'm here to share with you guys what's happened in my life. But it's not just to take up your time or just to be like, oh shame, look what's happened in her life. But to glorify God, to show you guys, to tell you guys and testify what he's done in my life. So that you guys can see, wow, if God has done that in, in, in my life, he can do it in yours. Amen. So I'm going to start with a scripture tonight from Revelations 12 verse 11. And it says, are, we gonna, are you guys doing the scriptures on the board? I don't know. Okay. So Revelations 12 verse 11. And it says, and they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. For they did not love their life and renounce their faith, even when faced with death. So every time I share my testimony, I'm declaring the blood of Jesus over my life. I'm declaring what God has done for me and I'm reminding the devil what Jesus has done. I'm reminding the devil that he doesn't have a hold on me anymore. And I can tell you now, probably every single one of you have a testimony. No matter how big, no matter how small, you have one. And it's so important to share it because every time we do, we declare what Jesus has done for our life. And it's so important. I wanna read another scripture from Romans 2 verse 11 that says, for there is no partiality with God. So when I share, then you realize, wow, uh, he's done it for me. Maybe you've gone through something that I haven't and I might go through it and struggle and then I can hear, yeah, wow, God has done it for you. He can do it for me also. Amen. 
So please, I just wanna encourage you guys now, share any testimony you have. How big, how small? Because like it just brings glory to God every time. So if you look at me now, I'm gonna start way from the beginning. I might look like a very good Christian girl, <laughs> but I wasn't always. I grew up, I didn't grow up in a Christian family, maybe like many of you, I didn't even know God. I sort of heard about God. Maybe you're sitting here and you haven't really even heard about God before, or you've heard about him, but you don't have a relationship with him. And that's how a lot of my life was. I'd heard about God. I'd sort of heard about Jesus. I'd never heard about the Holy Spirit. And that's how I grew up. It was normal for, for us in a family to give children alcohol at Christmas. It was normal to do these things of the world because we didn't know any better. And I thought of God as this big far away thing that could maybe strike me down with lightning or something. <laughs> but he's not that because I didn't know him as I do today. And through my testimony, after I got saved, I looked back on my life and I was like, wow, look what God did actually in my life. Look all the times he was there. Even when I didn't know it, he was always there. And this is where I want to share when I was about 13, 14 years old, I was in grade seven, I got the chicken box and man was I itchy. So my mom went to the shops to get me medicine and my friend was at home looking after me. And a man jumped over our fence and he robbed us. So he tied us up and he was really mad. And then my mom came back and he tied her up too. See, now my mom has a vein condition and he tied her up really, really tight by her, her, her ankles and her feet. She was like in this funny position and her hands and her feet started going blue. And I was so scared. But the next minute, I remembered in assembly at school, there was a prayer and it was the Lord's prayer. And I'm pretty sure I didn't even say it right, but I looked this robber. Now imagine I was a very small little girl. When I was in grade seven, I looked like a grade two. I was tiny and I looked this robber in the eyes and I just started saying, our father. I'm pretty sure I said throughout in heaven, not who art in heaven, but Anyway, God was there and I just carried on and he looked at me and he said, if you don't stop, I'm going to kill you. And then my friend started and then my mom started. I mean, it's a prayer that we just recited, but we didn't really know the meaning. And God was there because the guy literally packed up and he left, left like so quickly. And then we were able to get out and like get safe and stuff. And even though I didn't know God, he was there even though I wasn't serving him and I didn't really think he existed, he was there and he chased that guy away. He gave me a boldness that I've never felt before. Amen. And I'm going to read a couple scriptures just quickly so you don't have to put these ones up on the board. But I, I want to prove to you what I'm saying is true. I'm not just telling a story. In Isaiah 41 verse 10, it says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. And another one in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many times in the Bible does God have to say it? Amen. And I want to tell you that confirming he's always with you, even when you think he's not, even if you're in the lowest of lows and you're trying to hide from him, he's always with you and he knows you. Amen. Maybe you can sit here right now and think back on your life. Were there moments where you didn't know God, but he was always there? Because I'm pretty sure you, you can. I'm pretty sure every single one of you can think of a moment like that. So going into high school, I went into high school with this fear that I had. I went into high school with not being able to fit in in primary school. So all I wanted to do in high school was fit in. All I wanted was acceptance. And that got me doing the wrong things. 
I started hanging out with the wrong kinds of people. And then I started smoking because it was the cool and in thing to do. Then I started drinking. Then I started smoking weed. And then I started doing heavier drugs because it was the cool thing to do. I could hang with the guys. I could hang with the homies because I was cool. But it, it wasn't cool. I was searching for acceptance. I thought I was so free. Look how free I am. I can do whatever I want. But the very thing that I thought was, was giving me freedom uh, held me captive. The very thing my body craved was that so-called freedom that I had. It wasn't freedom. The only real freedom is in Jesus. Amen. And that's where I was at. I was at a place where I put up this mask. Look how cool I am. But on the inside, I was so sensitive and I was looking for something. I was searching, searching for something in my heart that I didn't know. I was alone and I was filling myself with all these extra things, filling myself with friends, filling myself with addictions in my life. Yet the hole was getting deeper and deeper and deeper because the only thing that can fit in there is God. But I didn't understand that. And I'm not just talking nonsense here. I'm going to prove it to you in the scripture. In Genesis 1 verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In his image, in the image of God, he created him male and female. You see, God created us so specifically that he created us for a part just for him. I mean, it's God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was on the earth, he, he carried the Holy Spirit in him. So we created in that image, we created to carry the Holy Spirit in us. We created to receive Jesus into our hearts. But before we do that, we don't understand why. We don't understand what, what our souls are longing for until we meet Jesus. So what happened was the taking just got worse and worse and worse. And I was trying to fill this gaping hole inside with all these fleshly things. But the, the, the problem wasn't fleshly. The problem was spiritual. Spiritually, I was empty. But then again, I didn't have the understanding. I want you to please get this next scripture on the board. Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. And when I read the scripture, I had such a revelation. I was like, wow, this is, this is where I was. And then I got the understanding. Do you guys have it? Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. If you guys have your Bibles, please read with. So it says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able, now listen to this, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. See, before you get saved, what, what I got out of the scripture was before I got saved, I didn't know. Before I got saved, I didn't have the knowledge of God. So like, I was just trying to fill all these things with, with, with fleshly stuff, not spiritual things. Now I want to read to you, in the scripture it says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit. I want to prove to you that you can't fix your, that hole inside with drugs. You can't fix that hole inside with whatever you're trying to fix it with. The only thing you can fix it with is Jesus. The only thing you can fix it with is the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read now from Galatians 5. This is also quite a bit of scripture. So Galatians 5, and I'm going to first read from 17 to 21. Awesome. 
Okay, so this is what it says. Look at the first line already. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. Confirmation. Okay. Now let's go on. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the, under the law. Now this next scripture is a list of things. Now it says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is where I was in my life. If you look at that list and you, as I continue with my testimony, you'll see I had a lot of these things in my life. And maybe some of you have these in your life too. But I was in this place where I just, man, I just wasn't in the right place. But now, I want to read from verse 22. Galatians 5 from verse 22. Now, this is the good news. See, there's the bad news. Those are the things that, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But look at the good news. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. So look at the second list. Wouldn't you rather have the second list than the first? As I continue, you'll see how I stepped from that, sec that first list into the second, because that's what Jesus does for you. When you get the, the Holy Spirit, these are the things that you'll have in your life. You don't have to have that first list anymore. You can leave that behind and you can step into what God has for you, which is all these amazing gifts. Amen. So by the time I was in grade 11, 17 years old, I was on all kinds of drugs. I was taking drugs at school. Every, every day, I was taking drugs at school and eventually my parents found out. And they put me in a rehab where they just rehabilitate you with more medicine. So you go from taking whatever drugs you're taking, doing whatever addiction you have, then to taking prescription drugs. Well, he has a sleeping pill since you can't sleep. He has antidepressants for this. He has a pill for that. He has a pill for this. Again, trying to fix the spiritual problem with fleshly things, and it didn't work. I was in there for like a month and a bit, manipulated my way out because all I wanted to do was get out and use drugs again. The moment I got out of rehab, I started using drugs again. Why? Because the spiritual problem wasn't fixed. And then, that year, in 2010, on New Year's Eve, we went to a party. It was just after I got out of rehab. And we were at a house party with friends and family of friends that, where you were supposed to be safe. And I went to bed, and I woke up, and somebody was raping me. And it was somebody I knew, somebody that I was supposed to feel safe in this place. And after that, I was even more broken than I already was. The walls I had built, I built even higher. The people I had in my life, I pushed even further. I had this ashamed, heavy, guilty feeling like it was my fault. I told people, I told my family, my mom and dad, I told the people there what had happened, but nobody believed me. And after that, I felt so betrayed and hurt that I just dove deeper and deeper into the drugs, deeper and deeper into searching for something because the hole I had was even bigger. The hole that I had in my heart was now gaping, but nothing could fill it. Eventually, 
I wanted to murder the guy who did this to me. See on the first list, I had murderous thoughts. I had anger. I had jealousy. I had all these these hard things in my life that was just weighing me down. And one night I just, I was sitting in the car and I looked up at the sky and I said, God, if you exist, I don't wanna do this anymore. I was done, I was heavy and I just, I couldn't. Literally a week later, I was planning the next day to do bad things. A week later, my parents put me in a Christian rehab. My parents who weren't Christians put me in a Christian rehab and that's where Jesus met me on my path. See, the way that I can explain it was, I had, it's like you pick up this bag in your life. So you pick up your bag and you put it on your back and you start adding all these things. I'm adding my cigarettes. I'm adding my fears. I'm adding my anxieties. I'm adding my uh, fear of rejection. I'm adding my alcohol. I'm adding my drugs. I'm adding all these addictions into my life and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Eventually till I couldn't do it anymore. And that's where Jesus met me. So I was in the rehab and I wasn't sleeping at all. I was having nightmares about what had happened to me. I was withdrawing. It just wasn't like I was not in a good place and there was Christians there. So the demons inside were not very happy, okay? I didn't wanna know anything about this Bible that they were trying to tell me about. And one day, I was there for about a week and a a man came and he, he sat with me and he said to me, I want to speak to you. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, teenage attitude. I was like, fine. And we went and we sat next to this little pond and he said to me, I know what happened to you. And I was like, okay. And he said, he described things to me about the night that I was raped that I hadn't told anybody. I was not perverse things, just other things that had happened. And nobody knew, nobody. And I was like, how does this guy know this? And he was like, God gave me this dream just for you. And I was like, wow. God's love literally just hit me in the face. Out of millions, think about this. How many billions of people live, in the, live on the earth? And God gave that guy a dream just for me? Just because he loves me? Just because he wanted me to be saved? because he didn't want me to carry all this baggage that I had. He wanted me to lay the baggage at his feet and take it from me. And he met me on my path there where I was. And I I encountered the love of God that I'd never encountered before. And I gave my heart to Jesus that day. But the next thing that happened was more difficult than just giving my heart to Jesus. He explained to me that I had to forgive. And I was like, yo, that's hard. And then he read me these scriptures that I'm gonna read you. He read me the scripture in Matthew 6, verse 14 to 15. And he said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But, now this is the scary part, but, If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. And I was like, yo, if I don't forgive all these people that I'm holding things against, if I don't forgive the guy that hurt me, I mean, I've done some pretty sketchy stuff in my life. I'm not gonna be forgiven. I can't afford not to be forgiven. I can't afford to walk around with this in my life. Now that I know the truth, I've encountered God love, God's love, which means he's real, which means heaven is real, which means hell is real, which means I'm probably going there if I don't forgive. So I was like, okay, I need to forgive. But it was a process. It was hard. And as I was going through this process of forgiving and reading the scripture, I learned some more about forgiveness. In Psalms 103 verse three, 
It says, who forgives all your inequities? Who heals all your disease? So now, forgiveness brings healing. Not just in your heart, but physically. Healing comes when you forgive. Then the next thing, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10. Now whom you forgive everything, I also forgive. For indeed, sorry, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. And that's when I learned that true forgiveness is praying for those people who you had stuff against. Praying for those people that you had to forgive, for God to forgive them now, so that they can also go to heaven. Because nobody deserves to go to hell. No matter what you think they've done bad to you, nobody deserves to go there. Everybody should go to heaven because God loves everybody. His love covers a multitude of sins. And that's what I learned here, that you can't wish these people that have done you wrong to go to hell. No, pray for them. And that's how you know true, you've forgiven somebody truly. You have to pray for them to go to heaven so they, that they can also inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. And then I would love to say from there, I was perfectly fine. And then I got out of rehab and I was shop. But unfortunately, I wasn't. I was stubborn and I was a teenager with no spiritual, good spiritual influence. So I got out of rehab. I met a boy in rehab who was addicted to heroin. Not Stephen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he was addicted to heroin and I'd never had any experience with heroin. See, I took a bunch of drugs, but I'd never taken heroin because I was scared of it. I was scared of needles, praise the Lord. So that was something that I was never exposed to. And when we got out of rehab, we um, decided, okay, now we good, we fine. So what did we start doing? We stopped going to church because we, we fine. You know, we, we done with the stuff now, but then we had no spiritual influence in our life. We had nobody to speak into our life. That's the biggest mistake you can make is thinking that you're fine. You need to be in church. You need to go to church. In the Bible, it says, do not neglect the gathering of the saints. This place isn't, it's more than a building. It's to have the, these people in your life that speak spiritually, to learn, to have accountability, to have people around you to help you through things. And that's where we went wrong. We didn't go to church. We decided not to listen to the people in our lives. And what did we do? We picked our bags up again. Because first we started smoking. Oh, it's just a cigarette. It doesn't say anything about that in the Bible. Oh, it's just now one drink. Oh, it's just now a couple tablets. Eventually, he was spiking my cigarettes with heroin and eventually I was addicted. And it only took a couple months. You see, we'd picked up our bags again because we made a core mistake of thinking we're okay and not going to church. And after that, my parents found out again. Obviously, we were being drug tested quite regularly, and my parents found out that we were taking drugs again. And now, if you'd been taking heroin, you have to take a medicine so that you don't withdraw, because heroin withdrawals can literally kill you. So we started taking this medicine, and I don't really know what happened, but I died. They said I overdosed on the medicine, I don't know. But, some people say I was dead for five minutes. Some people ate. I'm not sure I wasn't there. But <laughs> God saved me through the prayers of my family. I woke up and I had an encounter with Jesus and I knew that he was real, but I didn't know what to do with it. Now, I was only in hospital for one week after such a dramatic thing. I was fine. I was left the hospital completely healed. Okay. And then I literally met Stephen two months later. And that was when something changed in my life. I went to Pastor Dion's meetings and I was like, wow, 
you know, I rededicated my life to God because another thing, I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't have the Holy Spirit guiding me. So I went to Pastor Dion's meetings. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I rededicated my life to Jesus, okay? I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I, I was a new creation. Then I was like, oh, this is how it feels to be full. This is how it should be. This is how it feels to be light. This is, this is something fresh and new and powerful. And now I understand. Now I have the Holy Spirit guiding me and telling me and helping me through every situation in my life that I didn't have before. And it's, it's something that's just, oh man, the feeling of getting baptized with the Holy Spirit and being set free is completely just liberating. And if any of you, amen. And if any of you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, I encourage you, ask God to fill you and to fill you afresh every single time because it's so important. Amen. Amen. And what was awesome for me was when I met the hockey family, you see where I came, I saw that like I felt that Christians judged me because of my past. And when I met the hockey family and I told Stephen about my past, he was like, it doesn't matter. Only the future matters. And again, I came into contact with the love of God. I came into contact with how Christians should really be. Not judging people, but helping them. We're not trying to judge you. We're here to set you free. Jesus is here to set you free. And he loves you where you're at. He loves you on the path where you're at. But you have to be willing to let go. And leave it behind. And step out into something fresh. And... It took a while though for me to change. You know why? I believed wrong. You see, I got saved under grace. Amen, we're all saved by grace. But I believed grace wrong. I misunderstood what grace was. See, I thought grace was the ability to do whatever I wanted. I thought God's grace was sufficient for me to walk around and still do what I wanted to do. I could still drink and smoke and party and do what I wanted because saved by grace. But I wasn't living in victory. To live in victory is to know the true meaning of grace. The true meaning of grace is the power to say no to these things that are holding you back. The true meaning of grace is to say, no, I don't need those addictions in my life. No, I don't need that drink. Thank you very much. No, I don't need that cigarette because God has given me the grace to, to say that. The grace is the power to say no, not the power to carry on sinning. Grace gives you the power to live in victory, to live victoriously with all that stuff behind you. So step into victory and leave it behind because that's the grace that God has given you. And again, I'm not lying. I'll prove to you. (laughs) In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, it says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. See, in my weaknesses, God strengthens me. So my weaknesses, what were my weaknesses? My weaknesses were addictions, but God has strengthened me. His grace has strengthened me to say no and leave that behind. Then it says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Now, if you look at me now, I'm not the same as I was 10 years ago. I'm not the same that I was five years ago. Am I perfect? No. God is still working with me, but the closer I get to God, he burns out what shouldn't be there. The closer I get to him, he renews me. You see, for in Christ, I'm a new creation. Amen. I stand before you now washed in the blood of Jesus, baptized with the Holy Spirit, walking in power because that's what God has done for me. And I know he can do that for you. I'm here to tell you tonight that he loves you. I'm here to tell you tonight that he can meet you where you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what you think you've done. Whatever walls you've put up between you and God, it doesn't matter. 
because He loves you and He's willing to break those walls down for you. He's willing to meet you on your path. Amen. But are you willing? Are you willing to let Him meet you there? You see, we serve a God that doesn't care about your past. We serve a God who's willing to adopt you into his family. We serve a God who's used people like me, an ex-drug addict. We serve a God who's, who's used people like Pastor Dion, who used to be an alcoholic and a gangster. He's used so many people. I want to read a list that encouraged me so much of people that God has used. Just listen to this, okay? Now, this is a list of some ancestors of Jesus. And it includes an adulteress, Tamar. It includes a prostitute, Rahab. It includes Ruth, who was a non-Jew. Solomon, who was conceived after King David's adulterous affair. It, it includes Moses, who was a murderer. You may think that you are a mistake. You may think that you shouldn't be here on this earth, but God can use you. Are you a willing vessel for him? Amen. Are you willing to, you see, God, God is going to meet you in your process. He's not waiting for you to be perfect. He's not waiting for you to have everything perfectly in order. No, he's waiting for you to say, use me, Lord. He's waiting for you to say, I want you in my life. You see, Jesus is always there. Like I said, he's always there waiting, watching. What are you doing? Now it's time to turn back. Turn back to him. Because I'm telling you now he's going to embrace you and he's going to adopt you into his family. That's the revelation that I received is that Jesus died for me 2,000 years ago on that cross. I just had to confess it and receive it into my life. And there's so many other promises in the Bible that God has for us. So many. We just have to confess them and accept them into our life because that's the kind of God we serve. Amen. Oh. I'm laughing because I'm clapping. But I'm clapping for God, not for myself, okay? <laughs> Amen. I just want to tell you guys tonight, if there's one thing you get out of this, is that Jesus loves you. Put your bag at his feet tonight. Lay your bag down at, at his cross because he's willing to take your burdens. He's willing to make you light. He's willing to, to break everything off of your life like he did for me. So I want to ask the piano lady to please come get on the piano. But I want to ask you guys, <laughs> I want to ask every one of you to just bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to ask you a really, really important question that I was asked. And this is it. If you had to die right now, where would you go? Would you go to heaven? You could answer and say, 100%, I'm going to heaven. You could answer, would be like, maybe, I'm not really sure. You could answer and be like, no, I have that first list in my life. I have all these walls that I've built up and I honestly just don't think I'm going to heaven. But I wanna tell you tonight that you can change that answer into 100% yes. You can stand up and lay your burdens at the feet of Jesus tonight and recommit or just give your heart to Jesus. So if you want to change your answer tonight into a hundred percent yes, yes, I'm going to heaven. I would like you to raise your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. I see hands going up. Even if you have a maybe and you just want to make sure tonight, there could be things between you and Jesus, between you and God that feels like a blockage. Make right with him tonight. He's waiting for you. So all those hands again, just raise them up so I can see, please. 
Amen. I see hands going up all around. With everybody's eyes still closed, nobody looking, those who's raised their hands, will you just stand to your feet so that I can see you, please? Remember, you're not standing for me. You're standing for Jesus. This is a moment between you and Jesus. It's not a moment for your friends. It's not a moment for the people behind you, next to you. It's a moment between you and God. Do not miss this opportunity for Jesus to meet you on your path. It was the most important decision I'd ever made in my life. And I don't want you to miss it. For those of you standing, I would ask you, please come join me in the front. The worst part is over, I promise. <laughs> Will you guys come join me in the front? Everybody else, please give them a hand. Amen. Amen. Jesus is ready to meet you where you're at. He's ready to receive what, you, what you're willing to put down tonight. Hey! <laughs> Sorry, I know her. She was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's a very important, wow. That's awesome. Sure. I was taken aback there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to ask everybody else, will you stand to your feet, please? And I'm going to ask one more time, if you're still standing in your, in your seat and you want to join, please come stand in the front. This isn't something for me. This isn't something for the guy next to you. It's for you. It's, it's nothing to be ashamed about. These people that are standing in front are brave. These people that are standing in front are gonna meet Jesus tonight. And it's exciting and I love it. It's the most important thing ever. So I'm gonna count again. I'm gonna count again to three and I'm hoping, I know there's some of you still standing in the pews and I'm hoping you guys will come join me tonight. Remember it says in the Bible, if you confess me before, before, before people, he will accept you. But if you deny me before people, he will also deny you. And I don't want that to happen to you tonight. So I'm gonna count again to three. And please join me in the front. One, amen. Woo. Two. Two and a half. Two and three quarters. Okay, three. Amen, guys. Woo. I'm going to ask all you lovely people in front, please put your hands out, ready to receive tonight. All you lovely people at the back, stretch your arms out to these beautiful people. Will everybody in this entire church please pray this prayer with me? Say, Heavenly Father, right now I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that he rose again on the third day. Jesus, I invite you to live in my heart. I invite the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of me. I believe that my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus, Thank you for washing me in your blood. Thank you that I stand here now, saved, redeemed, and as white as snow. In Jesus' name, amen. Give these people a hand.
can I ask the band to come up while I just speak to these people? So we're going to want to pray for everybody. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you guys, guys to quickly fill in a little card. But when you come back into the auditorium, we're going to be praying for people with addictions. We're going to be praying for people that um, uh, have ha- had suicidal thoughts. We're going to be praying for people that are like bound by any any kind of addiction. It could be gambling, it could be smoking, it could be prescription drugs. We're going to pray for people that have been molested or raped. And we're going to want to pray for you guys also if you have unforgiveness in your heart. Amen. So you guys can turn to your right, my left, and they're just going to help you quickly fill out a card and then you can come back in while we're worshiping. If you have filled out a card already, it's okay, you can go back to your seat. But if you haven't, please will you yeah, turn that way. Everybody please give them a hand.